Uh, hello, everybody. Hello, world. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, I am not Jared Lander. I am Michael Demsko, and for that reason, I'm going to have a little cheat sheet today. But I just want to start off by saying thank you to George Brett and NYU for having us here. Um, the first thing we like to do at the meetup is ask who's hiring. So is anybody in the room hiring uh, with the organization or for private work, contracted work? We'll take anything. All right. If not, uh, we do have the Meetup Group Slack channel, so go ahead and if you're watching this online, drop a message into the job postings channel. Uh, we also have some announcements for conferences today. So uh, just here in a few weeks, we have NYR here in New York City. That's going to be on May 16th and 17th with workshops on the 15th. Uh, you can use code hack, NYHackR at rstats.ai. That'll get you 20% off of your conference tickets. Uh, and there will be a ticket giveaway uh, based on the people attending here in person today. So we'll do that at the end of the talk. Um, we also have the D4 conference coming up in Tampa, Florida. That'll be on June 5th and 6th. You can use the same promo code uh, on the website to get those tickets as well. Uh, we'll have some questions at the end here in person, but uh, for those joining virtually, you can go ahead and drop questions in the monthly meetup chat uh, channel within the Slack group. Uh, and if anyone wants to speak, please feel free to contact me. It's Michael Demsko. My email is mdemsko at Lander Analytics. You can also, of course, reach out to Jared if you have any ideas for a talk. We'd love to have you. Uh, we'll be joining each other for drinks at Half Pint uh, just around the corner afterward if anybody wants to go grab a beer. And then a uh, brief introduction to our speaker here. So we have Liam from Sparta, New Jersey. Yep. He is going to be talking a bit about the basics of data science. I'll let you introduce it from there. But otherwise, yeah. let's give a round of applause to Liam. All right, thank you, guys. So yeah, like, uh, like Michael was saying, uh, my name is Liam Dermody. Um, I'm a data scientist. Um, I'm working in Sparta, New Jersey right now. Uh, in, in the Sussex County area, working out of Denville. I have my time estimation. In the spirit of it being a stats meetup, I did my, uh, my time estimation in R with a little confidence interval thing. I was gonna be, it was going to be the best part of, of the presentation, a good joke to start off, but uh, it, with the technical difficulties, ended up uh, messing it up. Anyways, so two years ago, this was me. So very different from data science. Um, I was a raft guide in Idaho. And then I started getting really, really into the data science world. That's how I found myself at TechFlex, a company that's built 20 years of data that hasn't been used at all without any real infrastructure going. So what I'm going to be talking about today is building your infrastructure almost from the ground up. What are the first things you're going to want to be building when you're starting to look at your data in this way. So obviously data science has been a big hot topic. It's one of, it's one of those uh, key words, the, the like, hot words of the last couple of years. So one thing I did was pull up an article that uh, Harvard Business Review made and calling data scientists the sexiest job of the 21st century. I know that a data scientist wrote this because no one, no one in their right mind would actually say this. Um, <laughs> but uh, other than that, you'll see a lot of different articles. What is data science? What do data scientists do? What, what is data science? So I think it's important for us to really start breaking down what I'm calling the web of responsibilities that will be attributed to the data scientist, which is kind of the overall uh, umbrella under a, dumb, a bunch of different jobs. So the arrows don't necessarily mean this is exactly where it starts. You could start at, at any point in this, and other, other jobs will have more significance than, than um, others. Like maybe you'll be more engineering focused. But these are the five general jobs that you will have to understand, almost like a multi-tool in the data science sphere. So starting with architecture, when I was starting with our company, the first thing I did, and this is, this is AWS, you could build this on a bunch of different platforms, but AWS is probably the most common that you'll see. Um, you have your sources coming in. In here, we have a pretty complex enterprise level uh, architecture, but as a data scientist, you're gonna need to know the general gist of, of how 
your company is built from the architectural spect uh, perspective. Then you're gonna have your data engineers. Do we have any data engineers here today? All right, there we go. All right, nice. So you guys are working on the pipelines. I'm sure you guys could, could talk circles around me with the, with the pipeline wise. But you got your sources and you're building the pipelines and the ETL process. So you're cleaning data, you're gonna be uh, making sure uh, the data comes to analysts. Do you guys have teams of, of analysts also working for your company? Or you're also the analyst too. All right, so this, this is perfect. So you're gonna probably see things like this where there's a mistake maybe in your pipeline and you're getting a bunch of null and NAs. So what I've done here is visualized maybe like a simple, simple CSV and I've made all of the NAs and nulls in yellow here. And this is a really good way to quickly identify a potential problem in your pipeline. And then you can go back to the architecture and you know exactly where your problem is originating. So you guys use AWS Glue? Yeah, nice, all right, cool. The crawlers are definitely a good thing to know. Um, so the third thing is the business intelligence. So in, in my sphere, you'll, you'll have, in some of the larger enterprise companies, you'll have a business intelligence person that will be the person that'll talk to your managers, they'll talk to the executives, and they'll come up with lists of questions to talk to the analysts. So things like, how well is our campaign working? Why did sales take a dip? Are influencers working? That's a big question, because as companies are spending more and more money, it's like, what are we actually spending your money on? And what matters more, outgoing calls or incoming calls? Very, very simple questions that the stakeholders are talking about that need to be translated into data relevant questions. So a business intelligence person might know what the tables look like, whether they're using SQL, uh, they'll know what the variables are like. So you, it's very important to know all these things. It's important as a data scientist to be involved with the executives and the managers of the company. So the data analysts will take what the business intelligence people made or uh, asked and they'll make reports like this. So these are, these are uh, all charts that we've made from Scooby-Doo information. It's on, it's on Tidyverse. So this one in particular will, will show you what uh, amount of monsters were real or fake uh, coming in from the 1970s to 2020. And it's actually really cool because uh, Turns out people actually really like when the monsters are real. So you might, you might not understand that uh, until you start looking at the data. So what, what, it, what a data analyst will do is they'll start compiling all of these, these sheets, right? And what they'll do then, if you guys have a data scientist, is they'll send those up to your data scientist. So there's two types of data scientists. There's type A, which is a machine learning data scientist. And here's, here's a, a pretty simple uh, machine learning program that I've built, and it's predicting the sales based on calls. So each dot represents a month, right? Um, and what this, what this shows is a positive correlation between the number of calls made and sales. So a, a type A data scientist will work on this machine learning style. And you, can, you could use it for anything. We've seen the famous example of the perfect lap in track in race mania. So, you can, you can uh, have, have a program that at first starts hitting a wall and then, and then starts doing perfect laps. Um, that's, that's one type of data scientist. So when you're, when you're looking in, in the sphere to become a, a data scientist, you're gonna wanna probably choose which type you'd wanna be focusing on, right? All right, and then there's type B, which is the statistician style. And that's more what I do. I'm more on the stats based, but Starting is the hard part. So when, when you're eating the elephant, right, they always say you want to like, have it in bite-sized pieces. When you're breaking up the iceberg, um, you don't want to start getting ahead of yourself because as soon as you do that, you're going to be wasting your company's time, you're going to be wasting your time. So one of the things that I've recommended, and I, I got recommended this as soon as I started, um, was reading Wiring the Winning Organization. So it's a really great book. Um, except I have one small thing that I, that I cut out of it. So, oh, I don't know what happened to the ends here. <laughs> but um, amplification, 
I don't really pay uh, that much attention to. But the simplification and slowification, when you've got a problem, and I'll, I'll explain what the simplification and slowification are. But when you've got a problem, say it's on your influencers, right? The influencers aren't generating sales the way you'd want them to. Um, you're going to have a huge problem that you've got all of your data architecture, you've got your business intelligence people, you don't know where to start. So the first thing you do is you want to slow down and you're going to start breaking down those problems one by one. I like to start with a end goal. Here's what I want the end goal to look like and then working backwards and being really creative. So one of, one of the biggest things, and this is why you can find data scientists in, in any sphere. You can find them with a more scientific background. You can find them with a more mathematical background. I mean, you can, you can even find data scientists making quantum leaps across their careers. Um, but you want to have the creativity, and the only way to do that is slowing down. Um, and simplifying is that working backwards uh, style. So as you guys know, the name of the presentation today is the scientific methods of data science. I was talking to some of the people before. I had a lot of trouble um, actually coming up with the name for this presentation because you know it, it is such an interesting uh, topic because is it actually the scientific method? Is it uh, the philosophy of data science? Is it the mindset? And I think it's at the end of the day more the mindset. So this is the scientific method discovered and, and uh, researched in the 1700s developed. Um, and for a business, the one thing you can't do is test. So you can't necessarily cut off your arm or your sales for, for an entire month. You can't stop the machine when it's already running. It's like a business is like a living thing. So what people will recommend is the data scientific method. So the data scientific method is different because it is causal. So that's, that's the only difference between testing and causal. And I'll, and I'll break this down a little bit. So I'm calling these probes that I'll put out. So when I'm looking at a large set of data, say a million rows plus, and, and this, is a, this is a common uh, big data uh, piece of advice. Sometimes your big data problems are actually a series of small data problems. So what I've done is I've taken a limited number of uh, products right here. And to understand the data, I've charted them out. It kind of looks like Braille right here. But what this shows you is consistency. These are orders. Each one is an order. And it's in rows. So you can see, say, every three days. There's, there's an order. Say every three days there is this. And, this. and this is very close to time series. So another probe that I'll, that I'll do is once you start understanding your data more, you start seeing the causes, you start, you start understanding what the structure of it is like, what you're looking at, you start running seasonality models, your correlation models, your, your more statistical analysis, your math. Then you can start comparing. So, this is, this is where the data science starts getting really interesting. I'm sure you know with the, with the analytics side. So for here, I was making that machine learning pro program for uh, total monthly sales and calls total. And I've normalized the axis. And lo and behold, there you go. So choosing variables and kind of first throwing things against the wall, this would never have really happened until you start slowing down and start using those processes and testing. So the only way to do it is, OK, Let's, let's try something out. Let's try making, say, 500 plus more calls this month and what should happen to sales. And that's, and that's causation. Obviously, there's, there's the whole dilemma, and I won't really dive too much into it. Um, but data is kind of being considered as the new truth. It's, it's like the gospel of the modern world. And people are, are really just taking everything that data is, is uh, saying face value. We don't necessarily know for a fact what these things are. But casting wider nets, I know you're in the, in the fisheries, uh, casting wider nets usually ends up resulting in, in larger uh, catches. So the last thing as far as, as far as methods is you'll hear this time and again. Who, who else has heard this one? Yeah, describe, predict, prescribe. So this one I like find myself behind my computer like thinking about. I'm like, all right, am I going through my, have I described this? Have I predicted it and have I prescribed it? So the prescription is very much causal. It's really, really hard to see what that is because that's based on the description and the prediction. So 
however well you think that you've made those, in my opinion, the description is the easiest one. You can, you can or it's, it's the most reliable one. I mean, they always say that history uh, like repeats itself. So when, when you are working for a business, history is likely gonna repeat itself. All right, so data is a way of looking at the world. I, I was saying that it's the biggest uh, indicator of the truth nowadays. So let me, let me pose a challenge to you guys. So I want you guys to tap into your curious side. I want you to look at a, a, maybe a mystery or a subject you've always been interested in. Um, and then I want you to start following the scientific methods to start looking for your answers and surrounding yourself with like-minded people here. I mean, that's why, that's why you really come to these uh, data conferences. That's why you come to the statistical meetup. It's not just to hear me speak, it's to like meet each other and start forging connections. So uh, exchange contacts and uh, create a little team to uh, talk about a problem that you're interested in. So one thing that I've chosen is uh, archeology. span I love the, uh, the use of data science to look into archeology span and it's really interesting. And in my opinion, the next Indiana Jones is gonna be a data scientist. I, that, might, that might be controversial, I don't know. But I think, I think that he would be a data scientist because how else are you gonna find these things but with data? And we're finding shipwrecks around the world using data science because you're able to hone in on new things. And, and that's eventually where I wanna take the data science. But uh, yeah, today's presentation is pretty short. So you got to give you guys enough room to talk to each other and uh, eat some more pizza. But uh, yeah, thank you to Landry Analytics, George, Jared, and anybody else watching. And uh, yeah, that's my presentation. Thank you. Um, can it be a data engineering? Can it be just an input question? Yeah, for sure. Um, so as we know, our industry is full of a lot of basically made up buzzwords. Some of them have some tendril of connection to reality. One of those buzzwords is, Data lake. Yes. That, yes. I mean, yes. Are you, yes. Are you to take a side? Yeah. Um, so there's the data lake and then the data lake house structure. So the data lake house structure is, and I see you shaking your head. So the data lake house structure is like the new hot topic because everybody wanted a data lake in 2010. Now, as of like 2015, 16, everybody wants a data lake house. So a data lake usually is really only useful for a lot of metadata. Say you're in social media, say you've got uh, a bunch of YouTube videos, you have a bunch of influencers, like I've been saying over and over again. Uh, you will have more need for a data lake where you're needing to make all these crazy connections um, across data platforms. But the, the, what, what exactly about data, data lakes? Like, Yeah. What does, it, what does it mean to you in yeah. the world just because every, every, every person I have gives a different answer? Well, I think... If, if we can stick to data lake because lake house is a different... Yeah. So, so in, in my world, the, the data lake is pretty much the bread and butter of, of data science. Data science, you would really only need to stop at a data analyst if you just had a relational database, if you just had, let's just say, like a, a normal uh, data warehouse like you were started in the 70s and 80s. Um, the data lake houses where you're able to make those crazy connections, like we, we saw in LinkedIn. So LinkedIn for a while was wondering why they weren't having uh, as many people staying on, on LinkedIn. They were like, all right, well, I have to type in uh, the person's name exactly. But what they started doing is they started uh, phishing through contacts, giving access to your contacts, and making these connections. So it's like, you might know this person. Oh, that, that has your high school involved, you went to high school with this person. All that is metadata that you could only really get if you have a data lake. So the engineering process, and actually I'll try, I don't know what happened to my slideshow, but um, yeah, um, but the architecture I actually brought up um, earlier was a data lake architecture. So that's, that's what I've built um, with uh, the, yeah, I, it's not back, but it's fine. Um, I can show you after. Cool. I'd love to see it. Yeah. 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 You described, oh, got a ninja. Um, you described at the start that when you got there, there was nothing, and you had to build the infrastructure from the ground up. Can you describe how the architects worked with the various other roles to develop that? 
So since, since I was the only person uh, working on it, I was the architect, engineer, and everything else. So that's why, that's why um, this is the really interesting uh, topic for me to discuss, uh, because from the ground up, I've, I've you know, started the entire chain of data science at this company. Um, so as, as for me, the, uh, the real relation between, what the difference between an architect and an engineer is the architect is usually like a floating, when, when you see a professional architect uh, on somebody's LinkedIn profile or you see uh, an architect, um, somebody in conversation with you, they'll usually work for a like third party that will help you set up your, uh, your data warehouse. So they'll, they'll work for a company, like I've, I've worked with uh, Kalent, which is, which is a uh, big data warehouse building company. So the real people you have in staff are the data engineers. You, won't, you really won't have too many architects uh, in-house unless your structure is just changing all the time. You might have like something called like a platform team or something similar, which will constantly be like moving things around. And, and in AWS, the more you have, it, you might need more of that. But yeah, it's really up to the, the company. Yeah, any, any other questions? Oh, and I'll show you that uh, structure. Yeah, so, so this, is, this is your kind of modern, modern day uh, data lake. So you've got a bunch of different things. So the Kinesis, that's, that's really mostly just for social media. That, that was created entirely for social media and YouTube usage. Um, what else is a good one to point out? And I think, I think another important thing, the other reason I'm not gonna focus too long on actually building these things is they're changing 24 seven. As, as we progress, in 20 years, AWS not, may not even be the best uh, place to build your data warehouse. But as of now it is, so that, that's, why, that's why I'm, I'm showing this. And, I, and this isn't sponsored by AWS, by the way. <laughs> I, was gonna, I was talking to Jared and I, and I was talking about doing an entire AWS presentation, but I think this is, I think this is better and I think this is uh, more relevant, but yeah. So do you find a merging of roles of data scientists and ML engineers? I think, I think that ML engineers are more and more commonly going to start calling themselves data scientists. Um, I, think, I think that uh, ML engineer was definitely like a, a large uh, portion of data engineers that made, or sorry, of data scientists that made that switch later on. Because what, at the end of the day, exactly is the main difference between an ML engineer and a data scientist would be the components that, that make each other, they're, they're about the same thing. Um, I, think, I think that late, soon, I guess the answer to my question is soon an ML engineer could start calling themselves a data scientist. Um, but if you have anything to elaborate on that, I'd love to dive into that a little bit more. Yeah? So you kind of Yeah. We were kind of like the data engineers and the analysts, and now I'm at like a large company with a couple thousand people and a whole data platform team. And wow. I just find there's like there's pros and cons of each, like being able to directly access the data. Yeah. Is kind of cool, but you know, having it all in the uh, right now is kind of like Yeah, like which which is better, like having it back end cleaned first yeah. or front end cleaned first? It's, it's really up to like what, what your specific team is skilled at. So for example, there's, the, there's like a saying where it's 75% of your job is uh, doing ETL and, and cleaning your data before you actually even use it. So if you have a really good infrastructure for platforms already, then you're gonna wanna do that and just hire one data analyst. But other companies will opt for having a whole team of analysts and they just want that raw data and they're just like, all right, give me everything, don't do anything to it, I know how to do this and I prefer the way that I would do it better. Um, so I personally, if, if, I, if I was looking into making a switch from being a data engineer to a data scientist, I, I think that it really wouldn't be too tough because I've, I've, done, I've done both. and. Uh, I think that you're probably already doing a lot of what you would be doing as a data scientist, honestly, yeah. 
We have one more question from the YouTube chat. Um, so in your experience, do you see large, large language models as improving the bottom line for smaller companies or organizations? Yeah, I, I, think, I think that having an in-house um, analyst, data scientist, engineer, often gets hard to justify with a smaller company would be the only downside. Um, and also, if you don't have enough data for them to work on, so, so, it's, so the question would be like large data platforms, just the platform itself, or the amount of data your company actually has. Because I'd like to see like how much data your company actually has, how many, like whether that be SQL or, or uh, whatnot. I think um, small companies could uh, invest, there's, there's, I, think, I think what a small company, a startup is very famously uh, known for starting a data warehouse before they have any infrastructure of any other kind. So for example, Netflix is mostly what I'm talking about. Uh, very famously, they built an entire data warehouse before they even had a team of more than five people. Because what they wanted to do was have a really good way of connecting people to recommended movies, TV shows, et cetera, et cetera. So in, if it's a startup for like a tech company or something, then definitely. But if, like we're, if we're talking about manufacturing, you wanna wait until you've got a lot more data. Because I, I'll, I'll also make the uh, connection a lot of being a professional swimmer. And you can be the best swimmer in the world, but if you come in, in your bathing suit and, and all geared up, and then there's no water, you, can, you just can't swim. So you, you're gonna need the data to do it. Yeah. Question. I mean, it's very much along that the same lines. Um, I, I, it's, it's, it's fascinating, but it's like a lot of I heard that a lot of companies, especially like older companies, <coughs> the older company, the older a company is, typically like the, the weaker their data infrastructure tends to be, which I, I thought was like kind of crazy. But I, I've seen that at such, com such companies like at, at Yahoo Sports, etc. Um, and so I'm wondering if you think, um, like in this, in this like on a bifurcated solution set of like ha either having like really good data engineering or like good data analysts, like, you know, which is preferred, like can one overcome, compensate for the lack of like having the other or having like good infrastructure or like really good analytics? It's like on a, on a philosophical basis. So yeah. if I could just repeat the question for those watching online, it's essentially if you're forced to make the choice between working on developing your data engineering versus your data analytics practice, which one would you go with? Is that right? Yeah, yeah because there's, there's cases where companies are just focusing on the analytics and kind of and, and, you know, backdooring the, uh, the data engineering. I just don't know like, how far they can get. And, like, you know, maybe you have some thoughts on like, how that could ever work on, on a sustainable basis. Yeah, I do. I, I, think, I think that so the main purpose for analytics at the end of the day is making a prescription for a decision. That, that you're gonna make down the road um, and, and predicting. So let's just say one of these old companies has a lot of dirty data. And like you were saying, that they, it can be very dysfunctional at the end of the day because it's so hard. There's entire third pro company parties that will come in and reformat your data and they'll charge you like $200,000 just to come in and take all that old data and clean it because it, sometimes it's in a thousand different ways. Um, if you're a company that, let's just say, is very active in marketing campaigns. Maybe you're an e-commerce company. I could see having a more data analytics focused team, but if you're somewhere more in, let's just say, like the Netflix tech uh, side, maybe having a engineering team would be better because you want those processes and you want, you want to uh, prioritize cleaner data over anything else. Um, you're, you know that people are going to come back to the service, whether or not it's uh, be, whether it's 15% off Netflix that month, for example. Um, so it's like you know that people are going to come back because it's a reoccurring purchase type service. That that's my answer. That's kind of that's kind of tough philosophically to to answer that one. I think um, yeah, I think I think that's that's my answer. <laughs> it, that's a tough that's a tough one to ask. Um, like I said, again, it really depends on the skill level of the people you have in staff, too. I think, I think that if you already had the skill, and I, and I was saying earlier, like the uh, infrastructure for um, those more engineering-focused people already, then you're going to want to focus on that. If you've never had a data analyst before, 
then you're not going to want to be like, all right, we're overhauling our data analyst team to, or we're overhauling our engineering team to focus on data analytics. And then the other, and then vice versa. If you had a huge data analytics team, then you're going to want to do the opposite. Yeah. All right. right. That is all for this week. Again, we're going to go over to Half Pint, grab a drink after if anybody wants to join. Uh, there'll be information on the April meetup coming soon. So thank you, everyone here in person. And thank you, everyone online. See you next time. All right.